Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, again. We spent almost the entire time, the last time we met, uh, just on a couple of verses, the end of chapter 1 and verse 1 of chapter 2. And the wise men who traveled from the east to the west, searching for Christ, and we mentioned that the story of the gospel and the spread of God's revelation traveled from east to west uh, in opposition to the movement of the earth. Uh, now, in 2019, it's made its way all the way around the world, and once again, the focus of the world's attention is on Israel and the Middle East. And uh, by extension, uh, the European Union, think of Brexit and countries wanting to leave that union and so forth. But these wise men came, verse 2, let's read verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. This is the first question in the New Testament. Before Christ was revealed at his baptism, the priest asked John the Baptist, who art thou? They asked, Art thou Elias or Elijah, based on Malachi's prophecy in Malachi 4, that Elijah would appear again before the Messiah showed up? They also asked, Art thou that prophet? Uh, alluding to Deuteronomy chapter 18, God said he would raise up a prophet like unto Moses among the people, and to his word would be uh, the people would listen. And um, then they asked, Who art thou that we might give an answer to them that sent us? There in John 1, verse 22. After Christ's baptism, he said to those following him, What seek ye? John 1, verse 38. God's first question to the man and the woman in Genesis chapter 3, Where art thou? Somebody is looking for something in the Word of God and in the world. God is seeking for men. And in response, some men are seeking for God. The Bible says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, verse 10. The psalmist writes, I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Psalm 38. Verse 18. If you can admit your sin and your guilt, God is looking for you. God wants to do something for you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to do something with you and use you in some way. He wants to save your soul and forgive your sins. It shouldn't be a strange thing for Orientals to expect a Messiah to come. The Bible says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Genesis 9, verse 26. And uh, of the three sons of Noah, Shem represents the father of all the Asiatic Eastern races. By the way, beginning at Israel, the Holy Land, all the way eastward to Vietnam, India, China, Korea, J Japanese islands, all of that is considered Asia. From Israel all the way over to the far, far east. All of that is technically referred to as the Asian continent. From Israel westward is what we call the West, the European nation. So when they say something came, has to do with the West, they're talking about Western civilization, European uh, cultures, Europe European ideas, and so forth. And then to the south, of course, was the African continent. But um, it was from the descendants of Shem that we have the Oriental, the Asiatic races, including the Jews, including Abraham and the descendant, his, his descendants, the Jews, all the way down to the birth of Jesus Christ. Eventually, the Lord Jesus Christ was a Shemite. All of you that are Koreans 
in this uh, room are Shemites. Your original ancestor was Shem. Now, as God sought to filter and, and uh, delineate the, uh, the identities even more so, or define the definitions even more so, within all the Shemites, he selected one man named Abraham, and he pulled him uh, out, separated him from all the other Shemites, and said, I'm going to do something special with you. He created the, the lineage of the Jew and revealed himself to Abraham and his descendants, which would then mean all of the other Shemites are classified as Gentiles, along with the Europeans and the African races. So everyone who's not a Jew is a classified as a Gentile. Genetically, I guess you could say they're Shemitic, but doctrinally, they would be considered Gentiles. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the, church, or, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. In the world, you have unbelieving Jews. Anyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile. You have unbelieving Gentiles. But in the church of Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, you have both believing Jews and believing Gentiles combined together. They make up the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. But um, modern man, in his pride, he wants to dismiss the intelligence of the ancient world. And yet today, he couldn't replicate many of the architectural feats that we find all over the world by ancient civilizations, particularly in the East. Um, think of the pyramids in Egypt. Think of Stonehenge in England. And uh, how they use this, uh, they believe, as some um, uh, elaborate uh, calendar to mark the seasons, to mark the movement of the planets and the months of the year, uh, etc. Uh, the Great Wall of China. Think of some of the giant Buddhas carved uh, into the stone hillsides, which would make our Mount Rushmore pale, dwarf by comparison. There's... Um, was a, there's one in um, there's one in Seoul. There's a big Buddhist monastery in Seoul. Um, Bongyusa, is it Bongyusa or Bongyusa? I think so. Um, which is a tourist attraction now, but they have a 91 foot tall statue at the entrance of the Buddha, and that's a few hundred years old, um, and, uh, and that's one of the smaller ones. And these things built centuries ago carved right into solid rock uh, hillsides uh, it took uh, decades and decades to complete in those days. Think of the walls around the ancient city of Babylon. They estimate that the walls of Babylon were 80, 81, or 85 feet wide and 40 miles long. You could drive like six chariots side by side around the top of the walls and um, uh, some estimates, they're not quite sure about the height, but it may have been as much as 100 feet tall, 85 feet uh, wide and 40 miles long around the ancient city of Babylon. Um, architectural feats that no one today would even know how to begin. How to begin. There's, a, there's that guy who built the gardens down in, in Florida. What was the name of that city? Homestead, Florida. Who... Um, uh, unrequited love, his girlfriend left him, and so he built this elaborate gardens made out of rock and rock sculptures, and these things weighed tons, and one man was able to lever up these stones by himself, working in the dark, uh, with no one else helping him, and uh, they've got stones that are 10 tons from the ground to the top, and all you have to do is push it, and it swivels like a door in this wall, and this man positioned all of these things by himself, and nobody knows how he did it. And um, I think, where was he from, Latvia or some, some East, uh, Eastern European nation? Uh, as a tribute to his girlfriend who left him at the altar, she never did see the uh, structure he built in a tribute to her. But he claimed he had the secrets of the pyramids to move heavy stones, and he died and took the secret with him. But uh, modern 
man uh, thinks he's wiser than anyone else because he's invented uh, heavy construction equipment to move some of these things. Well, how do they move these things? We've got the great pyramids in Giza, Egypt, and each stone uh, weighing something like 40 tons. How do they move those and lever them up without the heavy uh, equipment they have today? As a matter of fact, most of the heavy construction equipment today would probably buckle under the weight, and yet they were able to move these things. And so modern man thinks he's smarter, he's wiser, he has more knowledge and understanding than the ancient world did. But not so. Not so at all. Um, look back, if you will, at Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, and uh, two verses there, verses 30 and 31. Genesis 10, verses 30 and 31. It says, And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. The people of Shem went eastward, after God dispersed them, um, following the Tower of Babel, and the flood, and so forth. Look also at Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Genesis 49, and notice there verse 10. Jacob blesses his sons. He pronounces over all of them. And he says, Genesis 49, verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. It, if the nations of the East knew anything about the history, the story of the Jews captive in Egypt before God delivered them out, and about the prophecies Jacob had made over his sons, uh, they expected a king to arise from Israel. Some great leader would come from Israel. Um, Numbers 24. Numbers chapter 24. Numbers 24. And um, we'll start there, verse 16. Here Balaam speaks about the nation of Israel. He was unable to curse because God wouldn't allow him, even though Balak wanted him to. Numbers 24, verse 16, He hath said, which heard the words of God, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter, shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheph, and Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city, and so forth and so on. The Magi, the wise men, were observing the stars in the night sky, looking for any anomalies until they found one, until they discovered one. We have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him, they said in our text this morning. I want you to, now, to think it was uh, some planetary or heavenly object in the night sky that hadn't been on any of the astrological uh, charts or astronomical charts. I guess astrology and astronomy were kind of hand in hand in the ancient world, that the movement of the planets had some effect on your life, uh, your day-to-day -day life here. But uh, to say that one star appearing in the night sky uh, directed them to travel westward from wherever they began uh, in search of a king is hard to believe. You see something in the night sky, 
you do not sure what that means. But go, if you will, to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1. And notice there verse 16. Revelation 1, 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. And notice there, verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So an angel can also be a star. We talked about the angels not just simply being messengers of God. They are an appearance of God. Um, in the Old Testament, think of, of the fourth person in the fiery furnace uh, with the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. Think of the one who Jacob wrestled with, said, uh, I'll let, not let thee go except thou bless me in the book of Genesis. And an angel is an appearance of God or an appearance of Jesus Christ beforehand, not simply someone delivering a message. And likewise, an angel can appear as a star. Do you know, every Christmas tree is topped with one of those two things, either an angel or a star. I don't know why that is, but it does seem to be the case. So, the star which they saw must have undoubtedly been an angel appearing night after night in that direction, uh, bidding them to follow in that way. Of course, when the sun came up and they didn't see the star any longer, they kept venturing that way until that night, and then they'd see it again and pursue in that direction, or proceed in that direction. Look in our text, Matthew 2, verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Yes, he was. There was no joy in Mudville that night. The, the, the idea of a divine king coming meant competition to his throne. His virtue, his purity, and power troubled Judas until he committed suicide. Seems like the Lord Jesus is, was talented at causing trouble in people's lives. That's why I mentioned in our sermon hour that the Lord Jesus is so much more than simply the meek and lovely, lowly Galilean who spoke sweet, kind words and never hurt anybody. And yet he'd scourge, uh, get a scourge and whip and uh, drive out the money changers and overturn their tables in the temple a couple of times. The idea that the Lord Jesus would never lose his cool <laughs> is a far cry from the Lord Jesus uh, depicted on the pages of the Bible. But the Lord Jesus, uh, his innocence troubled Simon Peter till Simon Peter betrayed him and went out and wept bitterly. His uh, followers, the multitudes following him day after day troubled the religious Pharisees and the scribes until they had him crucified. Look in our text, verses 4, 5, and 6. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, quote, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. Uh, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. The NIV, like so many others, trying to uh, attack the eternity of Jesus. In fact, Go back to Malachi 
That's from the book of Malachi, chapter 5. Go back to Malachi, um, chapter 5, or rather Micah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Micah. There is no Malachi 5. Micah, chapter 5. Micah 5 and verse 2. Here's the prophecy that the uh, scribes referred to. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And uh, I almost got ahead of myself a moment ago whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That emphasizes the eternity of Jesus Christ, from everlasting. He has no beginning, and he'll have no end. It's hard to conceive of a being that has always existed, and from him everything else exists. It's hard to think uh, that the, the creator of all reality is the one you and I serve, He's the one you and I know. He's the one who lives inside of me by the new birth. He's the one who guaranteed me eternal life. He's the one who forgave my sins. He's the one who came into his creation, uh, took upon himself the form of a man, lived among men, and then suffered at the hands of men to die for the sins of those men. And yet that's the God we serve. The God who made all of reality uh, is not limited by that reality. He can move in and out at will. Not so the God of Mormonism. The God of the Mormons lives inside his creation on one of his own planets. So uh, I, I guess, uh, theoretically, he's subject to the movement of that planet, if it moves, to the seasons, the hot and the cold, the heat and the uh, summer and winter time, and so he's subject to all of those things. He's subject to all the laws, the natural laws on that planet, like uh, you and I are here on the earth. So the God of the Bible, as the creator of reality, he is outside of it. He's not bound or restricted by any of it. He can live in and out, move in and out, however he chooses. That's why the, the concept of God among so many other cults is so small, so limited. They have a very limited view of God. They're a limit, limited concept of God. Not so the Lord God of the Holy Bible. Not so the God who lives inside the, the body of every saint, of every believer. How the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, can live inside of me is a great mystery. And yet, according to the scriptures, I can show you all the verses, that's exactly what happens. The Trinity of the Godhead lives inside of you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, by the new birth. It's, you know, it's, it's hard not to become a little bit proud, filled with a little bit of pride that the very deity lives inside of me by salvation. And I, I know him, he knows me, my name is recorded in his eternal book, and he's got a mansion already prepared for me. And he and I are in fellowship 24 hours a day. There's never a time when you uh, and God are not linked together by the work of the Holy Spirit. And by that same Holy Spirit uh, living inside of me and living inside of Brother Lee, living inside of my father, living inside of my brother, living inside of Brother Nathan over there, it, that same Holy Spirit living inside each one of us joins you and I together. Our flesh doesn't join us to each other, but the Spirit of God living inside each of us joins us together. That is what constitutes the a body of Jesus Christ made up of all believers in all ages. Some have died, their bodies are buried or, and in the grave somewhere. Their souls and spirits are at home with Jesus Christ. Those of us who are still here uh, inside these bodies, we're still joined together in the same body of Jesus Christ, stretches from earth all the way to the third heaven, fills the universe. Um, wrap your mind around that this afternoon if you can. But the concept of God among other beliefs is so small, so limited. 
I wish they'd expand their mind and learn a little something from the Word of God. But uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had no beginning, and he'll have no end. He has always existed. We think in terms of time, when something started, when something will end. It's hard for us to conceive of something that never started, or someone who never started, and it'll never end. And yet that's the eternity of Jesus Christ. Now, the NIV, trying to damage that, says in Micah 5, verse 2, he who has existed from ancient times, they put a restriction on it, not eternity from everlasting, but from ancient times. Well, that could be any time in the past. Um, the Amplified Bible, from ancient days. The New Living Translation, which is popular now. Um, the Distant Past. Uh, the Revised Standard Version, from ancient days. They're all chipping away at the eternity and the deity of Jesus Christ. Remember we talked about um, the modern Bibles in Luke 2.33. It's calling Joseph Christ's father. Un un compared to our Bible, which separates the identity of Joseph from that of Mary, the virgin mother. That should be the idea that Joseph is Christ's father. Every Christian believes in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. At least he's supposed to, or he's not a Christian. He doesn't understand who Jesus Christ was. If he doesn't understand that much. But uh, Bob Jones Sr. would say uh, in his years he never met the the Catholic or the Protestant or the Jew or the atheist who once they get saved doesn't suddenly believe all the Bible. That's a great observation. That when someone truly is born again they automatically believe everything they read in God's book. And uh, so if it says from everlasting that means he has no beginning and he has no ending and uh, never will. But the modern Bible is trying to chip away and whittle down the deity of Jesus Christ. In the New King James Bible, Matthew 7, verse 14, our Bible says, uh, Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The New King James Bible says, um, Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leadeth unto life. Of course, that can't be true. It's not difficult to get saved. It's easy to get saved. Admit you're a sinner and you need God to forgive you. He stands ready to save. He stands ready to forgive. But um, these modern translations, they want to downplay and dismiss the deity of Jesus Christ and play into the concepts in the hands of liberal Protestantism that just wants to worship the good, lovely, sweet Galilean who spoke the Sermon on the Mount and the 23rd Psalm, those are the only scriptures you ever hear in movies, right? Hollywood only knows the 23rd Psalm just about, and maybe 1 Corinthians 13, and then they want to water it down. The greatest of these is love sometimes. But um, anything except believe the text as it stands. Verse 7 in our text. Let me turn back over there. Verse 7 in our text. Then Herod when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Repeat that. I want to know exactly when you saw what you saw and uh, when you began to come this direction. Verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Of course, he had no intention of worshiping Christ. He plotted to kill him. He set out to kill him because the Lord Jesus Christ represented competition to his throne. And that was something he wanted to keep for his family if possible. Um, and you see this slightly modified but reenacted in movies. Think of the Terminator. Think of the Terminator. They send the hero of the opposition or they send a, a Terminator back in time to kill the one who would become the leader of the opposition when he grew up to stop him from being born. Herod, in a sense, is trying to do the same thing to stop this new king from growing up to manhood so he can never become his com competitor. 
that's what you have going on here is uh, people can't seem to get enough of the Bible. They love the Bible. Hollywood loves the Bible. They just don't want it uh, in its context from the Bible. They want to twist it and change it if they can. But um, let's read verses 9 and 10. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. The reappearance of the star to the wise men certainly fits the requirements that this star was an angel um, guiding them and not some heavenly object in the cosmos or in the night sky. You've seen the, the artist pictures, there's some star in the sky, but it's got one spotlight shining down on the manger scene. That's just you know, some artist's imagination. But um, then verses 11 and 12. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. The Bible says, they came into a house, not a manger, and they saw the young child, not a babe. Uh, jump ahead to verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. The young child, not a babe, was now in a house, not a manger, and the young child was probably between 12 and 18 months old, uh, allowing a little leeway for Herod to realize that the wise men weren't coming back, and then based upon the timetable they had given him when they started seeing this star appear and started venturing towards Israel. Uh, there's nothing quite like a little uh, Roman Catholic folklore and fairy tale to mix up the Bible and mix up the facts of the Bible. It should be plain if you just read the, the Bible in the plain sense of the language of the Bible. Uh, no matter what someone's ornaments on the front lawn depict of the wise men at the manger along with the shepherds, it didn't happen that way. The Lord Jesus was probably a year and a half, close to 18 months old by the time uh, the wise men arrived. And they went to a house, I would imagine, um, like a lot of societies, they expect those little ones to start walking ASAP. Mama doesn't want to carry it around, carry them around everywhere they go. Christ might have been standing and walking already by 18 months, I suppose. Um, and uh, at the oldest of seven children, you read the end of Matthew 12, Matthew 13, Christ had at least six brothers and sisters younger than him. So he was younger, the oldest of seven. Then uh, that was a busy household. You imagine, um, well, if you never grown up in a household with a lot of children, my wife did, six children, but if you're not from a household of seven children, well, you can imagine the wild times, right? You can imagine all the excitement they, they have in that household. Your family getting ready to go to synagogue on Sabbath day. There's only one outhouse, right? <laughs> Everybody use, everybody's, we had one bathroom when I was a kid growing up, just the five of us. And they're all squeezing in to see the mirror, you know, comb your hair and so forth. But uh, that much, sometimes people don't read the Bible and say, these were real people just like we are. Their lives weren't that much different than ours. Sure, the times were different. The conveniences and technologies were different and uh, so forth. But people are people. And they go through many of the same experiences, whether they they're in one town, whether they travel, whether they go from one country to country to country. But in their heart, the same emotions are evoked. The same things uh, dwell in the hearts of just about every man, every woman. And sometimes we don't want to give the Lord Jesus and the apostles and the characters and the stories we read in the Word of God credit that these were real people. They had the same feelings, the same aspirations, the same um, desires, 
that that we have. They were moved, motivated by jealousy and rage and anger, uh, like people today are. People like of all ages have been. But um, the young child, not a babe, in a house, not a manger. The wise men came probably almost a year and a half to two years after they started seeing the star, based on what they told Herod, and he realized that they weren't coming back. He went out and slew all the children in the coast of Bethlehem. See, all he knew was Bethlehem. He didn't know that by this time, the Lord Jesus was it, probably with Joseph and Mary back in Nazareth, which they returned to after they went to Egypt. We'll get to that next week. But uh, So Herod slew all the children uh, in and around the coast of Bethlehem, two years old and under, just hoping to make sure he killed Christ in the process. But uh, God had the last laugh. And a sad, terrible, tragic thing. We'll talk about that next Sunday when we come back to this uh, text.